My name is Michael. And my name is Nathan, and we're so excited that you've joined us for Riverland Hills Online Worship. If you're a first-time guest with us today, we'd love to invite you to text hello to the number on your screen. It's a great way for us to be able to connect with you, and we also can get you a free cup of Loveland coffee. We also want to encourage you to share today's worship service on any of your social media accounts. It's a great way for us to engage with new folks. As you guys know, we have a lot of amazing things going on here at the church, and one awesome thing that has happened this week is the students' staycation. It has been an amazing time to gather again as a student ministry. We have had around 100 kids show up, and it's been an awesome time. We've been studying the book of Judges and just really pouring into student lives, and all that's made possible because of your generous giving. And so we want to just encourage you to continue to give faithfully. That's right. Today, we have a special service. Pastor Ryan has taken us back into the book of 1 Peter, and we can't wait to see how God is going to speak to our hearts. And what gift of grace is Jesus, my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give for he is my joy is my righteousness and freedom and my steadfast love 
is my deep and boundless peace. To this I hope that my hope is only Jesus. For my life is wholly bound to Him. And know oh, how strange and divine I can sing. All is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in shepherd will defend me through the deepest valley he will lead oh the night has been won and i shall overcome yet not i but through christ in fate I dread I know I am forgiven and the future sure so the price it has been paid for Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon and he was raised to overthrow the grave to this I hope my sin has been defeated and Jesus now and ever is my plea and know the chains are released I can sing I am free yet not I but through Christ in me with every breath Follow Jesus, for He has said that He will bring me home, and day by day I know He will renew me until I stand with joy before the throne. To this I Let's pray together. God, we just thank you for all that you are doing and, and that you are faithful, God, and we love you and we trust you. And as we continue to look at 1 Peter, God, just help us to stand firm in our faith, God, and to not waver, but to worship you, to glorify you, and live our lives for you, Lord. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. God's word is so powerful and it is so 
practical. I love the fact that we are studying a letter that a disciple named Peter wrote 2,000 years ago, and it has direct application for us in the midst of a pandemic in the year of 2020. Uh, Peter was writing to people who were scattered, and these believers were scared because they were scattered, and they were in a strange world, and it didn't feel like Kansas anymore. And so he wrote them to encourage them. And so here's these people that are scattered and don't understand what's going on. Here we are in 2020, we're scattered, and we don't know what is going on. They felt like they were in a strange culture. We feel like we're in a strange culture. They needed encouragement. We need encouragement. They needed hope. We need hope. They needed instruction on how are we supposed to make it in the day-to-day, and we need instructions on how to make it in the day today. In our study of 1 Peter so far over the past couple of weeks, we have looked at, first of all, the living hope that we have that comes from our resurrected Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so that is the hope we stand on. It's not a wishful thinking, but it is a living hope. And then last week, we walked through what it looks like to be, a, uh, to be one that lives correctly in a corrupt world. How do we do that? And we want to continue this morning with the issue of faithfulness and us remaining faithful and the essentials we're going to need. This is instructional. What are the essentials we're going to need to remain faithful? And faithfulness is a calling, not just when everything's going well, but faithfulness really shines when times are tough. And we're all going through those tough times. And so essential for living, number one, is this. Essential for faithfulness that we have is this. I love differently. So Peter's instructing his people as they're scattered, your love is going to be different from everybody else's. Join me if you would in 1 Peter. In 1 Peter chapter 1, and today we're going to start in verse 22. And listen to what verses 22 and 23 say. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, uh, through the living and abiding Word of God. Now here's the thing. While we walk through a strange world, while we walk through awkward times, here's what we need to realize, that we love differently. Well, why is our love different? Why is my love different from the world's love? And here it is. He spells out that our love is different because we've been born again. Our love's different because we're part of the family of God. Our love's different, as he says, because our souls have been purified by the blood of Christ. And because of that, we are different. So our motivation for loving others is because of Christ's love for us and because of what Christ has done for us. You see... The definition many of us use of what love is and the definition many of us use of how love works is we think of love just as a feeling. We think of love just as an emotion. Or we think of love just as an opinion that I may have of someone. But love is based off of not my opinion, not my emotions, not my feelings, But love is based specifically off of what Christ has done for us, what he's done for you, what he's done for me, because he set the example of what that love looks like. So we must build that love off of our second birth that we have been born again. Why do I love others? Because we're part of the same family. Why do we love one another as Christ followers? Because we're brothers and sisters. We're we're all part of this same family. Well, how will our love be different? And he gets really, really specific on how our love will be different. First of all, he uses two different Greek words for love. And this is significant. There are three different Greek words for love, but he uses two of them. Note what he says in verse 22. He says, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love. 
Now, that's the word philos love or Philadelphia love is the actual Greek word. You know, the city of Philadelphia is known as the city of brotherly love because that's the exact translation of the Greek word. Uh, this is friendship love. This is bro love. This is, hey, you're my friend. I care for you. It's, it's that level of love. But he puts a word in front of it, the word sincere brotherly love. Well, that word sincere in the Greek, and I love this, this word sincere in the Greek, uh, the Greek word is actually two different words. The first word is without, but the second word is pretend. So the word sincere literally means without pretend. Now, some of you are struggling in your relationships right now. Some of you are struggling in the way that you love others and how people love you because what's happening is, is that there's a bunch of pretending going on. And so your relationships are hurt and your love is, is, is not uh, able to, to do what it's supposed to do because you're not loving differently and the way you love differently is you do it without pretending. That's what he says. But the second word he uses for love is he says, after he says a sincere brotherly love, he says, then love one another earnestly from a pure heart. It's a whole different Greek word. That's the Greek word agape. Now, agape love is the Jesus love. Agape love is the love we learn about in John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, that's the word agape. In other words, agape love is a sacrificial love, and it is a decision-making love, that I decide, I choose to love you whether you're going to love me or not. I choose to love you and to reach out, and I am willing to reach out and to, in action, show my love to you, even if I don't get it in return. It's a sacrificial love. That's what agape love means. Now, some other interesting words that he uses here that are very helpful for us. He says, agape one another, love one another, earnestly. Now, this word earnest means at full stretch or in an all-out manner. It's a, it's a word that really is, is like an athletic word that, that, hey, you've seen that runner in an all-out stretch. He's going to stretch out for the finish line. And that's what this word earnestly means, that fervently or earnestly, however your translation says it, that we are loving sacrificially at an all-out stretch, that we willingly do that. And then notice what he says, too, in this, so much in here. He says, love one another earnestly, that's with an all-out stretching out, doing it with, with everything in you, from a pure heart. Now, this issue of a pure heart deals with the issue of motive. I mean, let's get real for a minute. One of the things we struggle with is, is the, the motive behind why someone loves us. Is it a pure motive? Is it from a pure heart? Some of you right now, you're confused in your relationships because you don't know the other person's motive. Matter of fact, maybe your motives aren't pure. And without that, we're not going to have the brotherly love that we need, but we're not going to have the sacrificial uh, decision-making that love that we need to have for one another that we're going to care and love for others as well. So my love will be, here's three applications for us. First of all, my love will be consistent. This is an issue. We're inconsistent in our love. Again, some of you are struggling right now with this issue of love because Someone's been inconsistent in their love towards you. So if we're going to really have a love that's a brotherly love, that's a sacrificial love, then that love must be consistent. Secondly, that love must be sincere. It is time to drop the pretending. You need to evaluate your own heart and ask yourself, am I just playing a game here? Am I just pretending or is my love for others for real? And do people see a sincerity in me or, or do they see me just faking it? Uh, a third uh, definition of what love needs to look like according to what Peter has taught us here is that my love must be willing. That I must be willing to take the initiative, to step forth. God took the initiative to love you. That's agape love. 
God chose to send his own son for you. He chose to reach down for us. Uh, Religion is about man working his way to God, but Christianity is about God coming to us. God's reached down to us. And he's done it with agape love. It's how much he loves us. And so we do the same. It's not an issue of feeling, but it's an issue of willing. So the first essential element of faithfulness is I love differently. But the second element of faithfulness is this, I stand firmly. Our world's been shaken. Everything we've known as normal four months ago has been altered, right? It's all very different. And so in the midst of that, we're wondering what is firm, what lasts, what stands, what can I stand on when things are fading the way, fading away and going crazy around me. Well, Peter addresses that because he's dealing with Christ followers that are in a strange land, in a shaky time, being persecuted, and they don't understand what's going on around them. How do you stand firm? This is what he says. Look at verses 24 and 25 in chapter 1. All flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. Listen, everything of the flesh is like the grass. Now, we've had some great rain this summer in Columbia, so my grass is looking good. But, you know, in a typical summer in Columbia... Your grass can look good one day and then a couple of days of scorching heat and your grass starts to wither. Or you plant a flower bed and you water it well and then go on vacation and you come back and you haven't watered it or someone hasn't been there to take care of it. And guess what happens? Those flowers look withered. Everything on this world is going to wither. It's going to fade. It's going to fail. And so that's why we must decide now what will last, what will be permanent. And we must plant our life firmly in what's going to be permanent. And what's going to be permanent, as Peter says specifically, is the word of the Lord. That's what remains forever. What he's doing is he's quoting Isaiah 40, verse 8. Grass will wither, the flowers will fail, they'll fall, but the word of the Lord will remain forever. So we must receive our instruction from the right source. If you're getting your instruction right now from other people's opinions, or if you're getting your instruction right now from culture, if you're getting your instruction right now from the way the world manages things, if you're getting instruction right now from from your own opinion, those things are going to fail and fade. Our instruction comes from the Lord. My opinion doesn't alter the Word of God, but the Word of God alters my opinion. My thoughts don't change God's Word, but God's Word changes my thoughts. And so it plants me firmly. Essentials for faithfulness, number one, I'm going to love differently. Essential for faithfulness, number two, I'm going to stand firmly. Essential for uh, faithfulness, number three, I'm going to live uniquely. Now, i got to be honest with you, as we move into chapter two, uh, Peter starts meddling a little bit, and he starts getting real specific on our faithfulness and real specific on some things in our life that shouldn't be there. Look at uh, chapter two, verse one. So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. And this word picture he uses here with this phrase, put away or take off, it it basically means to take off soiled garments. That I don't need that on me anymore. That's got to go. I went this week on one of the most hot and humid nights I think we've had here in a long time. And I went and hit golf balls at the driving range. And I got to tell you something. Uh, I was so nasty and so sweaty. I had to get home and peel that shirt off me. And that thing needed to go. It did not need to be on me any longer. It was soiled, and it needed to be taken off. And that's the picture he uses here as he says, look, there's some things that need to be removed. There's just some things that don't look good on you. So let's take them off. The first one he says that doesn't look good on you is malice. And by the way, as we walk through these five words, I'm going to call them relationship wreckers. 
because if we're going to live uniquely, we've got to deal with these things that hurt our relationships. And I want you to understand that Peter is writing to Christians. And he's writing to Christians saying, there's some things you Christ followers need to take off. He's not writing this to a pagan world. He's not pointing, pointing fingers at the culture. He's saying, Christ follower, believer, family member of faith. Here's some things that have got to go. Malice, first of all, is a general word for hateful feelings or strong dislike. And Peter says, we've got to take that off and get rid of that. I mean, if you were to really seek your heart and to seek some of the struggles that you're having right now, you may have hate or strong dislike to a person, a people group, and it needs to be addressed because it cannot be there. He says we must remove it. Second word he uses or second relationship wrecker is deceit. Now, this word deceit I love because the picture of it is so clear. The word deceit literally means in the Greek to bait. Now, the best way to think about this is fishing. Fishing is a game of deceit, right? You're trying to deceive the fish. And the way you deceive the fish is that you put something on that hook to cover it up. And you put something on that hook that would deceive the fish. His favorite color, something shiny, a worm that he likes, some type of bait or fish that that fish may like to eat. And so you use that to bait it, to deceive it. But what you're really doing is you're hiding the danger. You're hiding the hook. Another way you can look at the word deceit is, is, is trickery. Here's what's happening in some of your relationships for some of you, it's not the issue of hate or it's not the issue of the word malice where you have strong dislike towards someone or something, but it's the issue of deceit. And some of you have been deceived. Some of you are frustrated because someone in your own households deceived you. Some of you are struggling right now because you are intentionally baiting someone else, tricking someone else to get your way. And Peter says, nope, that doesn't look good on you. Take it off. Third relationship record that he gives us is hypocrisy. Now, this word hypocrisy literally means one who acts a part. It was used, the word came from uh, back in the days of Greek dramas where one person would have, you'd have a, one person that would have the happy face sign they would put on that looked happy and then the sad, gloomy face sign they would put on and you never knew which person it was. It was either the happy face or the sad face, but behind those masks were the one person. And so hypocrisy is when we act the part the actor Tom Hanks that many of you know and have watched many of his movies, he has acted in over 89 movies over decades. I mean, that is a huge career. I want to show you some different parts that you'll remember that Tom Hanks has played. First of all, this is Tom Hanks in Castaway as Chuck Nolan. You may remember that movie, that he was a FedEx executive that was on a FedEx plane that crashed in the ocean. He ended up as a castaway for many, many years. And so that's the part he played. Tom Hanks was Chuck Nolan. But look at this picture. Tom Hanks was also Forrest Gump. Life is like a box of chocolates. Remember that? I mean, Forrest Gump, he played that part. So some of you, when you think of Tom Hanks, you think of Forrest Gump. Here's another one. Do you know that Tom Hanks is Mr. Rogers? I mean, look at this picture. He plays the part pretty well, right? He looks just like Mr. Rogers. What about this one? Tom Hanks has also been Captain Solenberger in the movie Sully. You know the true story of Captain Solenberger landing, emergency landing, an airplane on the Hudson River. And in the movie, Tom Hanks plays this part, but he looks way different from the role of Chuck Nolan in Castaway, right? And this might be my favorite role of Tom Hanks. Look at this picture. Yep, it's Woody from Toy Story, right? I mean, Tom Hanks is the voice for Woody. I love Woody in Toy Story. 
And so you might say, well, I think of Tom Hanks as Woody. No, I think of Tom Hanks as Castaway. No, I think of Tom Hanks as Sully. No, I think of Tom Hanks as, as Mr. Rogers. Now, it's one thing for an actor to do what an actor's paid to do and what an actor's supposed to do. An actor plays different parts. But here's why some of you are miserable in life, and here's why some of you are frustrated with your closest friends and family members, is you never know what part someone's playing day after day after day. You never know if today's the day they're playing part A or today's the day they're playing part Z. And some of you can't keep friendships, you can't keep relationships, and people are frustrated being around you because they never know how you're acting today. It's hypocrisy. It's what it's called. It's the actual word is acting. And some of you need to stop the acting and get faithful with Christ. And Peter says this is one of the things that's got to go. A fourth thing that's got to go is envy. Some of us cannot function right in good times or bad times because we're jealous all the time. We're envious of what other people have. We're envious of other people's looks or talents or we're, we're envious of their abilities or we're envious of their possessions and their houses and their cars and their vacation homes and their boats and on and on and on and all the things that they have. And what happens is, is envy eats us like a cancer from the inside out. Some of you have damaged relationships today because of envy. What are Peter's instructions? Peter says it doesn't look good on you. <laughs> you got to get rid of it. You got to take it off like those soiled clothes. The fifth relationship wrecker that he mentions is slander. Now the word slander specifically means evil speech. And slander in the church is this. Let's get real clear. Slander in the church is rumor and gossip. There's plenty of other places in Scripture that talk about this issue of gossip. But there's no place for it. It is damaging when we go behind someone's back and make someone up, make something up about them, and we talk about them, and, and we say things about them behind their back. And so often in the church, we get caught up in rumors and falsehoods and gossip. And friends, that is not healthy. That does not belong on someone who's faithful. That does not belong on someone who says they're a Christ follower. It doesn't look good on us, and it should not have any part in us. And we must do what Peter tells us to do. By the way, when we take off soiled clothes, it's intentional. It's not going to happen automatically. It's not going to happen unless you do it. So I want to encourage you and challenge you, just as Peter has said. Again, this is uncomfortable. Peter's meddling with us right now, right? But it's clear these are some things that have got to go. Fourth, essential for faithfulness is I mature spiritually. And, and look at the progression here. If I understand that I've been born again, I'm going to love differently. And, and that changes the way that I, I think about things. It changes the way that I love if I understand that I'm firm in the Word of God and I can stand firmly, if I understand that because of being born again and because I stand firmly on the Word of God, that my actions are going to be changed, that I'm going to live uniquely, there's some things that just don't need to be in my life that are going to go. Well, because of all that, guess what the natural outcome's going to be? The natural outcome's going to be that I mature spiritually. So look how he words this. Another Really neat illustration, word picture he gives us. Verse 2 of chapter 2. It's actual verses 2 and 3. Like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. This word that's used here is, is you long for it as, as, they, as a newborn spiritual, as a newborn infant longs for milk. We, we crave it. We develop an appetite for it. And the question is, do we have an appetite for spiritual things? And in challenging times, this is a time for us to be uncovered and laid bare before God and evaluate these things. Do I have a worldly appetite or do I have a spiritual appetite? What is it I crave? And he uses this issue of an infant, and he uses this picture of growing up into salvation, that there's some areas and ways that we just need to mature spiritually. We just need to grow up. 
I mean, we expect an 18-month-old toddler to be immature, right? We just expect it. I mean, we, we expect that they're going to have a swing of emotions because they're figuring out their emotions, right? I mean, we expect that a, a young child is going to be insecure when mom leaves the room, right? Have you ever seen a baby or a young child watch a mom leave a room and they freak out? Why? Because they're insecure. Now, we expect that from a baby. We don't expect that from an adult. Or what about this? Uh, young children have a very short vision for the future. I mean, think of this for a minute. How many times have your kids been playing with toys? And, for example, there's hundreds of Legos laying on the ground. And they've got one Lego in their hand, and then a brother comes up and takes that one Lego from them, and their world crumbles. Why does their world crumble? Their world crumbles while there's thousands of other Legos laying on the ground. But that was the one Lego they wanted, and that was the one Lego that they have. They have a short vision that there's 2,000 other Legos, but they had to have that one. So all these things that children do, children are gullible. They'll believe anything. Uh, children don't grasp the larger picture of the good for the future and an eternal view that there's more than just the moment of playing with those toys at that moment. And so we don't want to be stuck there as adults in a world where we have a swing of emotions, we're insecure, we have a short view of the future, we're gullible, we'll believe anything, we don't think eternally. No, we grow up so we go beyond those baby things and move up in maturity. And that's what Peter exhorts these believers to do while you're going through persecution, while you're scattered, while the culture doesn't seem normal to you, while you're in a strange world. In the midst of all that, we must mature and we must grow. And church, that's my heartbeat for you. It's my heartbeat that you would grow maturely and that this time is not wasted time. The time of a pandemic is a great time for us to grow spiritually. It is a great time for us to learn how to love differently. It is a great time for us to learn how to live uniquely. It is a great time for us to learn how to stand firmly. And it is a great time for us to learn how to stand, to love, to grow, and to not stop growing in faithfulness. We must learn how to live faithfully no matter what the circumstance is. This is not a time for petty differences. This is what one of the things that Peter's addressing. He says, look, the petty differences are gone. They don't matter. This is a time for us to embrace our common salvation and for us to grow up in it. And for you to grow up, you've got to start by being born again. It's the first thing that Peter addressed in this passage we read. You've got to be born again. I wonder today, have you been born again? Do you know the life-changing impact of Jesus Christ on your life? Do you have a relationship with Jesus Christ? Have you received his grace that he offers to forgive us of our sins? Have you placed your faith in Jesus Christ? Some of you need to do that right now. Others of you, you're immature in your faith and you know it. It's hurting your relationships, it's hurting your mind, your attitude, your speech, everything about you it's hurting. And you need to rededicate your life to the Lord. You need to get deeper in God's word and you know that today you need to make that change and, and you need to turn your life around. I want you to know in whatever decision you need to make, you are not alone and we're here to help you. It's our joy to walk with you. You'll see a number on the screen, a keyword that you can text. And if you'll text that to us, we'll get back with you this week. You can also email me at pastor at riverlandhills.org. And it would just be our joy to walk with you. We're family. We're born again together. And we want to walk with you in any spiritual decision that you make. Heavenly Father, you've challenged us through the words of Peter. There's a lot here that we need to address, and it can be very challenging to deal with these issues. But, Lord, here's what we want. We want to be faithful, and we want to walk faithfully even in the midst of a pandemic. So give us the strength to make these changes we need to make, to take off these things we don't need on us anymore, to stand firmly. Give us the strength we need, Father, to do these things, to live uniquely and to love differently. Lord, we can't do it without you. We're desperate for you, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. These days have created an incredible opportunity. You know, when the way things were can no longer be, it's always important that we try to discern what it is God might be trying to teach or reteach us as a church family. 
In the words of Charles Spurgeon, God no longer gives us new revelation. He instead rivets the old one. And congregational singing moving forward as a church is going to be one of the main ways that we measure the quote-unquote success of any given worship service. And that goes for our online worship services as well. And so we want to try something new for a while. That every time we end one of our modern worship services, we're going to sing a very old song called the doxology. These words were written over 350 years ago, but they have become a staple in Protestant worship services just like ours. And I think it's pretty neat to see now that young and old, all walks of life, are together, connected by the World Wide Web, to sing and praise to God together. So it's just four lines, but our prayer is that because of how rich these lyrics are, that it will spur some questions for you or your little ones, or those that you're around, to discuss who is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost? Who is this God from whom all blessings flow, like the song says? Armed with only a pitch pipe and no instruments but our voices, would you join us as the worship team leads us in this final number of our worship service, the doxology? Here's the key of F with our pitch pipe, and then we'll sing together, okay? Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and 